Good morning, everyone. Today's sermon topic is man plans and God laughs. Honestly, I hadn't heard this expression until last year, but ever since I've heard that expression, I've found that it describes my life very, very well. And today I want to reminisce for just a moment to kind of set up the uh, sermon for today. Um, the Google machines suggest that this statement originates from a Yiddish proverb, der Mensch tracht und Gott lacht, which is roughly translated into English, man plans, God laughs. This thought is also similar to the quote by the boxer Mike Tyson, who's better known for his ear biting than for his philosophy, where he said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And I believe that this principle is close to the one that's found in Proverbs 19.21, which for those of you that read the bulletin and looked for Proverbs 19.31, there's not one that was a misprint. 19.21, many are the plans in the mind of man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. And in the end, God's plan always prevails. I want to use my life as a case study this morning of how this principle has worked. And I'm going to tell you about 10 different significant points in my life where I had a plan and God had a different one. The first plan was when I was age 16. Um, I hated school with every core of my being. I wanted to join the army when I was 17, but my mom wouldn't sign for me. So I waited until I was 18. Um, I watched the movie Rambo and I thought that's what I want to do for my life. And so I joined the Army. I signed up to be an Army Airborne Ranger, and my plan was to be a lifetime Army Airborne Ranger. That lasted about two months, when in basic training in AIT, I realized that I like to think creatively and outside the box, and they didn't like that. The second waypoint, I decided to go ahead and get my honorable discharge, or try to, and I eventually did. And at age 22, I decided I'd get a bachelor's degree at the University of North Alabama, and then go into federal law enforcement preferably the FBI. This one graduated or lasted until I graduated college when I applied at seven different federal agencies. One said they weren't hiring the FBI and the other six said they weren't hiring me. So I had to figure out another plan. At age 26, I decided I was gonna get a master's degree and try for federal law enforcement again. This one lasted until I was age 30. I applied again. The FBI said, come on, and they interviewed me, and I took the test, and I was ready to go. And then I realized that I didn't want to go into federal law enforcement because I'd already finished all my classes, and I had pretty much finished my PhD. So at age 31, I was going to use my newly minted PhD to teach at Indiana, Purdue, Fort Wayne for the rest of my career. Uh, the Barnes know Fort Wayne well. They drive through there all the time seeing grandkids, but most of you may not. It snows a little bit there. And so that plan lasted until I was 33 when Natalie told me that Fort Wayne was too far for her family and too cold for us, and so we had to find another plan. At age 35, I got the job at EKU, and I, my plan was to finish there. Then 9-11 happened, and I was activated for two years. And then I came back at age 37. I said, I'm going to go back to EKU and finish my career there. EKU has trended toward a department of critical criminology. I'm not a critical criminologist, so I decided to look other places. And then at age 40, many of you know, uh, the, we used to have a program here called Go Ye. And what they would do was they would use people like me that didn't preach regularly to go to small congregations and preach at different places. And so I was invited to go preach at Lee County Church of Christ in Beattyville. I went over there, I preached, they were very nice. They asked me to come back the next Sunday, I went over there, I preached, they were very nice, and they said, we'd like to have you as our full-time preacher. And you know, church people are really nice. And so I just thought they were being nice, and I said, well, thanks, I appreciate that, and then just left. Well, the third time I went and preached, they captured me at the door. And they said, we would really like you to be our full-time preacher. And I said, this is an hour and a half away, I can't be here every Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. And they said, well, just be here on Sunday morning, that's all we ask. And I said, okay. And so then I became a full-time pulpit minister for on order of eight or nine years. Um, at age 46, I decided that I was going to go to MSU, Mississippi State University, and retire there around 65. And that lasted until last year when I took the job as a family minister here, and I'm never going to make, well, I don't think I'm going to make 65 at Mississippi State. At age 47 in Mississippi State, 
I was asked to be a fill-in minister at Magnolia Church of Christ in Columbus, Mississippi. I go over there, I filled in, and I did that two or three times, and they called me in December of 2013, and they said, can you preach for us until we get a full-time minister? And I said, sure. And so about 2015, I said, are y'all still looking for a full-time minister? And they said, no, we, we think we got one. And so I stayed there until um, basically last year. And then the last waypoint, um, or at age 55, I said I was going to work until 65, and then Natalie and I would travel in an RV, or I think that was our plan, until we developed a new plan. And that one lasted until November 21, when Natalie passed away. And because she passed away, I was open to considering this job as a Richmond family minister. Honestly, if Natalie were still alive, she would have said, no, Dave, you are not driving up there every week during the school year for eight and a half hours one way. She, would, she was much more logical than I am. And so that's how I ended up as a family minister. Now, I will tell you that there were the first three or four of those decisions that I made had nothing to do with God. When I was 16, I was trying to get out of the house. I was trying to get out of my life. I wanted to join the military, get away from it all. I never consult consulted God about any of that. When I was 22, when I got out of the military, I really didn't think about God in that decision as well. But most of the decisions since then, deciding to make that decision, I consulted with God. And God has led me in these directions. Now, I will tell you, today that the plan I just told you probably ain't gonna work out either. I've got a history of plans not working out and God always has a different plan than what I think it is. So someday in the near future, you're gonna look back and say, yep, Dave, you were right. That's not the plan that God had for you. And I think most of you can look back at your own lives and you can say, you know, mine's similar. To, well, I hope it wasn't similar to that one, but your experience is similar to mine in that you have made plans and they didn't work out like you thought they would. But if you made plans with God, most of you would admit you're in a better place now than you would have been had you followed your plan. And that's because God's plan is always better than our plan. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Turn with me to Isaiah 55, verses eight and nine. Isaiah 55, Verses eight and nine. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. What I believe that scripture tells us is that God does not always do what we think he should with our lives. We think that God should do this, and God says, you just don't know. I have a better plan. God does not always do what we ask him to do in our life. I prayed diligently that I was going to be, that I could be an FBI agent. Looking back now, that would have never worked out. Um, I don't like dressing up. I don't like being bored. And there's all kinds of other things. But that was just not a gig that I would have done well. God knew that. And so he sent me in a different direction. If you've ever tried to be a Christian in Washington, D.C., which is where my first duty station would have been, it's a whole lot harder than Richmond, Kentucky, or Columbus, Mississippi, or basically anywhere in the Deep South. And so God knew that, and he, his plan was not my plan. And God's ways are not always my ways. We have to surrender to God's ways in our life. And so sometimes we want to do something, but God says, no, don't do that. And we have to say, okay, God, I'm not going to do that. That's the first thing we need to remember that supports the idea of man plans and God's laughs. God laughs. Then turn to Jeremiah 29, verses 11 and 12. Jeremiah 29, 11 and 12. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. When we follow God's plans, it leads to goodness in our life. It leads to great things in our life. Then turn to Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. 
Whenever we made a big decision as a family, I know this is a very simple way, but we would create a T chart. And on one side was staying, the other was going, and then we would list rows and then we would say which was better off, staying or going. Honestly, one of the things that we always considered was the church where we were going. And we knew that Starkville had a big congregation with a huge youth group. And so that was an important consideration for us, which basically equalized that for Richmond. And so we went to Starkville based largely on that decision that we weren't going to lose anything in the congregation. Honestly, I was only there about 18 months and then I started preaching all the time. So it didn't really factor into me, but it factored into Natalie and the kids and their growth as Christians. And so whenever we think about what we're going to do, it's important that we realize that we need to lean on God's understanding. Some of you have heard me tell my used car story. I am not a used car salesman. I'm a used car purchaser. And I've purchased a bunch of them over time. I was telling two or three people this week, I won't mention any names, but they're in the audience. Um, one of the persons that I bought cars from, I just called and said, person, I have $6,000. Meet me somewhere with a car that cost $6,000. And the first time I saw the car was when I pulled in the parking lot, and that was the car. Every one of those decisions was better than my own used car decision. Because I'll look at one, I'll say, yeah, that's a good deal, and it ain't. And I keep doing that, and it ain't. And so I think your experience is likely that with God. That you have a decision, you have a choice, and then it ain't the better choice. And so with God, God always gives us the better choice. God's plans will be revealed to us when we seek him with all our hearts. In Romans 15, 13, we read, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. God's plan gives us hope. God has a plan for us to join him in eternity. And that gives us hope that we will one day do that. The third scripture that supports this plan of God's is Romans 12, 1 and 2. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, we're taught that by sacrificing our will to God's, then we will understand God's will for us. There it reads, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Many of you probably think like me sometimes. I wish God would just hand me a note and say, Dave, do this. This is what I want you to do. It would be so much simpler for me because I'm a very simple person. But that's not the way God works. We have to pray to God and study the word. And from those places, that's where we get God's will for us. Uh, Wednesday night or Sunday, we talked about Christian mentors and those people in our lives that are important to us. Seek those people out when you're making a decision because they will know or they will tell you what God's or their impression of what God's will is for you. But the Bible is by far the best place to learn that. Because if our bodies are a living sacrifice to God, everything we do has him first. When you're thinking about a decision as to what I should do, think what God would do. And that's what you should do. Because if we transform our minds, that's going to transform our plans. There were several really dumb plans that I had in life that you haven't heard about today. None of those were godly plans. And so when we transform our minds and plan for God's will, that will help in our decision making as well. And God's not going to laugh at our decisions nearly as often. Then turn to Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to those that love the Lord. When things don't go our way, we have to remember God's purpose for us. Sadly, in our minds anyway, the human mind, God's purpose for us is not for us to be rich, happy, and famous. God doesn't care about that for us. If we somehow get rich, happy, and famous while we're here and are still doing God's will, then God's happy for us. 
But God's will is that we join him in heaven. And so when things occur in our lives and we say, I don't understand this. I don't know. I was trying, God. I was wanting to do what you wanted me to do. Later on, you'll understand that was God's purpose for you. And it was because of that, that God had that decision for you. In 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4, we read, This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God wants us to be saved. He wants all of us to be saved. And so when we plan, we need to remember Proverbs 16, 9, the heart of man plans his ways, but the Lord establishes his steps. You can plan all you want, but God's will is going to be done. And then James 4, 13 through 15, James 4, 13 through 15 that Jesse read, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Ephesians 5, 5 and 16 says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Our lives are a vapor. Those of you that are 50 years of age and over, those days are just flipping by. And when I was seven, summer flipped by, school days lasted three weeks each day. Um, and as we get older, we realize how fast time goes. It's a vapor. And we have to make decisions every day and every decision with the realization that our life is very short and we have to make those decisions for God. You say, how do I make those decisions? Galatians 5, 22 and 23 gives us a guidebook to make those decisions. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If you look at a decision and you say, is this a loving decision? That's a checkbox. Will this make God joyful? That's a checkbox. Will it bring me peace with God? That's a checkbox. Will it show patience? Will it show or allow me to be more kind? Will it allow me to be, as my kids used to say, gooder? Will it allow me to demonstrate goodness to others? Will it increase my faithfulness and gentleness and self-control? If the answer is not yes to all of those questions, then it's likely that's not the best decision for you. God gives us a lot of different directions to follow, but that's a really simple checklist to use because the fruit of the spirit means that if you're doing that, then you have the spirit in you and you are making those godly decisions. This morning, some of you left your house and you might not have planned to be baptized. You might have been praying about it. You might have been thinking about it, but you weren't at that point yet where you said, I need to take on Christ. This morning, that's the decision God wants you to make, to take on Christ, to be baptized into his church and to be a follower of him. Many of you here today have already been baptized. But sometimes we do things or say things or live our lives in such a way that we need public confession or we might need the prayers of the congregation to help us with whatever we're struggling with. God admires that decision. And that's a godly decision for you if you're at that place in life. This morning, whatever your need, please come forward as we stand and sing.